Inside the ruins of an abandoned temple, you have come in search of treasure and grand adventure. I am Elithides, with the pen and hand of destiny. It is here within this very chamber that the cosmic forge was secreted by those who had stolen it. And in the time since the forge was lost, a horrible mishap of events has transpired, which now threatens the very existence of the cosmos itself. Inside a tiny bird of steel, you have traveled far into the stars. For months, the journey has continued. The strange machine man known as Elithides, saying little to ease the discomfort of the cramped and confined quarters. Until, at last, the planet Guardian. We have arrived, exclaims Elithides, and everyone scrambles as he activates the teleportation device by which you were first brought aboard so many months ago. You suddenly find yourself shimmering into a strange new world. The Wizardry series goes back all the way to the early 1980s, and it was one of the seminal series that prompted the development of the computer role-playing game genre. And throughout the 1980s, it created game after game that was absolutely amazing, stunning, taxing in its difficulty, and very, very rewarding to the player. And the pinnacle of these old-school Wizardry games before the more modern Wizardry 8 was naturally the last DOS game in the series, Wizardry 7. Wizardry 7 starts off much like Wizardry 8. You are a band of medieval adventurers who are exploring a dungeon when you are whisked away on a spaceship by a strange creature and go to a bizarre planet, this time called Guardia. And when you get dumped onto this planet, you really start off the game having no idea what the heck you're doing. It is the epitome of a video game that you absolutely need to immerse yourself in fully. This is like the absolute polar 180 degree opposite of a casual game. This game you can't just pick up and play very quickly. In order to play the game with any success, you have to absolutely sink yourself completely under the water into the game's world. And without doing that, you're not really going to have any success. Even if you follow a strict walkthrough, you're still going to be lost about what you're supposed to be doing and why most of the time. You have to be willing to give 100% of your time for many hours a night in order to play through this game, and many, many nights are going to go by before you're finished. This is a very old-fashioned concept of a game, a, a game where you just have to dedicate the entirety of your attention to what's going on. You have to focus everything on it, which is very different from today's modern gaming scene, which seems to encourage people to play games that they can dive in and out of and do other things while they're enjoying and not absorb every single second of their mind, body, and soul in the playing of it. So when you land on this planet, you really don't know where you're going. And the only thing that you see is this amazing cutscene with this woman that glides down from the heavens on some sort of strange space science fiction motorbike and gives you a vague warning or pronouncement about what you're about to do. You also get this strange text that you see here, and it kind of informs you that a grand adventure is going to begin, but you're not really clear on what exactly you're supposed to be doing, what, what goal you're going for. Even in other games that are a little bit more mysterious, like Planescape Torment, there's a little bit more of a hint of what you have to do from the beginning, but in this one, you're totally naked, and it's up to you to figure out what's going on. This is a game that is the perfect example of what I referred to in one of my Dark Souls 1 playthroughs as archaeological gameplay. Most games tell you a story. The kineticism, the force, the impetus of the story is from a teller, someone who's giving the story to you and leading you down a path that you have to follow. That storyteller brings you from point A to point B, and you can react at different points to what he's doing, but ultimately that storyteller is in charge and is explaining you the story. And it's done in a very similar fashion to a book, or a movie or a television show. But video games have the option of doing something a little different. They can allow you to, in my words, be a game archaeologist. The story exists, and you can follow it and interact with it, but it's incumbent upon you as the player of the game to dig up the story. We usually think when we talk about games in terms of story here and gameplay there. However, in reality, 
The perfect game should wed story and gameplay together. They should be betrothed right from the beginning of the story. And in this game it really is. In order to play the game, you have to learn the story. And in order to get the story, you have to play the game. You're not told the story, you have to dig it up from what's there. And it's perfect for a medieval role-playing setting, because what you're doing is very similar to the role you would find yourself in as a knight in Europe during the Middle Ages. You're surrounded all around you, especially in the Dark Ages in the 6, 7, 8, and 9 hundreds, with these mysterious ruins, these strange buildings that you vaguely know from legend are related to some sort of ancient culture or people. But you don't really know why they were built, who these people were, and you only have the vaguest help from digging up their old artifacts and reading some dusty old scrolls that managed to survive whatever apocalypse destroyed them centuries ago. The story is there, and just like a medieval scholar, you have to dig up what happened to this ancient civilization, what they believed, what they thought, what they felt, what their world was like, and how the world became the ruin that it is today. And that's the exact position you're in in Wizardry 7. You have to discover through this ruined, dark, desolate world exactly what's happening around you, why everything ended up this way, figure out the strange religion of the past, and thwart the evil people that have come into play to prey on the ruins of this once flourishing planet. I mentioned in my Wizardry 8 review that the setting, the look, and the feel, all of the intangibles of the game, what we could call or put under the general umbrella of atmosphere, was done better in Wizardry 7, and that is absolutely true. Wizardry 7, right from the off, has this bizarre, oppressive quality to it. There's something magical about being locked into that tiny DOS perspective that you get at the beginning of the game, when you just look out through this little window into this strange world, and as it it begins, it's clearly an empty world, a bleak world, a place that maybe was once living, but now has been scarred and ruined by something horrible. It's frightening through the incredible minimalism of just a faint gust of wind playing in the background to sort of highlight the emptiness of the world around you. The first city that you go to, uh, the seemingly not very imaginatively named New City, is creepy and weird and empty, and it just feels so desolated and destroyed. We learn later on in the game that New City was once a flourishing metropolis, where a variety of different races and cultures came together to work with one another, but that at some point their internecine conflict flared up again and they began to brutalize and kill one another, eventually leading to the ruination of the whole city and the whole attempt for the society to work together with one another again against war, and it's just so sad to prowl through these empty streets. We play a lot of video games where we're wandering around ruins, but we don't really get the meaning behind the ruins and the, the epic human tragedy that took place to turn this once flourishing center of life into an empty land of putrescence and darkness and gray dust. We really get to feel the misery of those people in, in that city, and somehow they just magnificently use all of the tools they had at hand with the pixel art and the limitations of DOS to make this a reality. And it's absolutely amazing that this carries out throughout the entire game. It helps you get interested in this world with this amazing setting that you play in. And speaking of the art and the design, the pixel art here is incredible. The monsters look amazing, and as I said in my other review, better than those in Wizardry 8 with the cheap early 3D models. This game was made at the pinnacle of pixel art in the early 90s, when they really made, where designers were able to make absolutely beautiful and amazing works of art art with the very primitive technological limitations they had. And it's just a feast to look at. It feels amazing. All of the intangibles are there. All of the strange aura around the game is absolutely perfect. And it feels exactly like King's Quest, or maybe even better than the original Dark or Demon Souls, in creating an empty land filled with monsters that was once flourishing, but that, that age is long gone, and you're a, a warrior that has to trod these streets and destroy the monsters monstrous remnants of a society destroyed by its own pride. It's perfect, it really helps you draw you into the story, and I love it. Now, I'm gonna get back to the story later on, but at this point I want to change tack from the atmosphere and feel and aesthetic design of the game to talk about the combat. This is really all that keeps you going for a long time in this game, the strange purple prose at the beginning about mankind having a destiny, and this young woman talking about the prophecies of the time. So you're really left with not understanding understanding what to do or where to go. In the opening area of the game,
game, it plays a little bit like Dark Souls 1. There is one correct path that you have to go down, and all of the other paths lead immediately to... Certain death! Yeah, so you have to figure out exactly where to go, and there's a lot of trial and error involved. One way, your party gets put to sleep, and you can't really continue past it, just like in the Field of Poppies and the Wizard of Oz. Down another road, you might be able to beat some guys, but they're kind of challenging and you might want to get a little bit more equipment first. Down another road that leads to the opening hub area of the game, you're going to be jumped by a huge number of ratkin, these weird humanoid rat thief creatures. And it's really impossible to beat them early on. What you have to do is first go down to the Trainee Dungeon, and you can get some basic armor, weapons, weapons and a few levels, and crucially an amulet of life that allows you to resurrect dead characters, and then you're finally ready to go to New City. It has just a wonderfully creepy, eerie atmosphere. You know, you get a sense while playing this that something horrible has happened here, and there are creatures inhabiting the ruins of a once flourishing civilization. Everything about the game has a kind of grimness to it. It reminded me a little bit of the first Diablo game, where Tristram has a kind of aura of sadness over everything. A tenebrous, evil kind of atmosphere is everywhere. It feels kind of sad. This opening area of New City is very confusing and very complicated, and doesn't really stand out as an exceptionally brilliant sort of gameplay design. You see, Wizardry 7 is done in a kind of Metroidvania style, where you have to go back and forth between different areas as you gain more items and more abilities to go unlock doors and go through special places and gain levels in order to defeat tough enemies. If you thoroughly explore New City, you'll find all kinds of creatures, all kinds of places, all kinds of things you can go, and plenty of them you absolutely have no reason to touch at all until sometimes 40 or 50 hours later of gameplay. And if you're first going in there and don't know this, it becomes really confusing and irritating, and it's going to take a long, long, long time to work through it all. For instance, in the first area of New City, the first place you'll likely get to, you see this mysterious dialogue box come up telling you about vivid red emblems on the doors to these buildings. Buildings. And you think to yourself, well, what does that mean? Should I go in there or shouldn't I? And if you go in there, you're going to be instantly killed, just utterly demolished by the creatures within, who are vastly more powerful than even a party that's imported items from Wizardry 6 can handle. You'll just be destroyed instantly. You have no reason to go in there for 50 or 60 hours of gameplay. That's when you have to come back to it. And yet, immediately after this, right next to this building, is another building with the same vivid red emblem on the side of it that you actually do have to go into, and it contains creatures that look identical to the ones that will kill you in the previous building, except that these are a lot lower level, and even though they're tough, they're definitely doable, it's an approachable fight. So that's a really confusing, messed up way to start your game, just to have this ultra-difficult fight next to a f almost identical, manageable, difficult fight. I, I mean, it's just, it's crazy. And yet, if you pay attention, of course, you're gonna figure this out, and you have to really, really think before you do anything in this game, or everything can go extremely badly for you. Wizardry 7 is designed a lot like Wizardry 8 in that there's no safe area. There's no town zone where everything is okay and you know you're not going to get attacked or unlikely to be attacked. Every single area, every single square of Wizardry 7 is essentially a dungeon and you can be attacked on it anywhere. Even if you go into the inn and rent a room, you can be attacked in your bedroom. And in the opening area of this game, you have to actually unlock the starting merchant. There's an area called the Arms of Argus, which sounds sort of like a weapon shop, and it, it indeed is. However, if you go in there, you're going to be accosted by this strange creature, and he's going to demand a password, and if you don't give it to him, he's just going to run away, and you're not going to be able to access the store. So you have to go to somebody else, the innkeeper, and tell him about the Arms of Argus, and and then he's going to give you the password, and then you can unlock the store. It's extremely confusing, and the fact that you have to do this in the very first area before you unlock a, the, one of the most important merchants in the game, that's really, 
really tough. Wizardry 7 has the best system of character creation and development I've ever seen in an RPG game. It's really satisfying to create a party with so many disparate races and classes. You get the standard fantasy races of elves, dwarves, gnomes, etc. But you also get strange, monstrous creatures, my favorites. There's lizard men, cat people, dog people, some sort of weird yeti creature. It really gives you a rich feel to roleplay in. You also get a wide variety of classes, and this is where the game really, really shines. Choosing exactly what mixture of classes are necessary for your party, and how you're going to change the classes of the characters you have is really interesting, and it's just full of all sorts of possibilities. There's lords, which are sort of like paladins. There's valkyries, which are female-only characters that have the ability to cheat death and avoid a fatal attack. One of my favorite classes is the psionicist, who has a sort of mixture of divine healing spells like cure paralysis and heal wounds, and unique attack spells like psionic fires, and most especially things like psionic blast and mind flay, which not only does damage to an enemy, but it has a chance of turning them insane Sane, which means they may miss their turn or attack other enemies. This can be a game-changing thing in a fight. And I just like the idea of an all-powerful master of the mind. It's something that's kind of left out, unfortunately, of a lot of RPG systems and video games to have weird mind powers, like in the Complete Psionics Handbook. And I love that it's included here. There's also Samurai, which can do critical strikes that instantly kill an enemy, or ninjas that can do the same thing but also hide in shadows and fight just with their bare hands and feet. The game not only includes multi-classing, but it really encourages it. The more advanced classes, like the Lord or the Samurai, have the ability to cast spells and do melee attacks, and those classes are really essential. There's, there's no benefit to staying with a class that just does melee attacks or just casts spells. There's, it's best to do both so your characters have a diverse set of skills to attack any particular situation they're in. The only problem is that when you level up, you do randomly level up your stats, which is really annoying because you may have a really beefy fighter who upgrades his intelligence, which he doesn't really need. But if you're one of those mixed classes, it's probably best to have a mixture of different stats, so I guess it works out in the end. This can lead to some weird situations. For instance, my psionicist has a strength of 18. 18 strength, so, I mean, he's a spellcaster, so he's walking around, presumably carrying a magic stick and wearing wizard robes, and yet he's also just completely shredded and has like a six-pack and just like these brilliant guns. So, it, I mean, it helps with carrying capacity, but it's kind of strange. When you create your characters at the beginning of the game, it can be a little bit irritating, because, you see, this is an old-school game, and when you roll your character, it randomly assigns how many points you can level up and your stats. That is, your strength, intelligence, piety, vitality, etc. You start off with a base number of stats depending on the race that you pick, but the number of bonus points you get then is randomized. So you may have a number of bonus points only to get a limited number of classes, a very simplistic class like warrior or mage. If you want to start out with one of the fancier, more complex classes, that means an endless amount of re-rolling, and you can spend hours doing this just to get it perfectly right. I think that Wizardry 8 really handled this better and just allowed you to do it from the beginning. It's kind of annoying. You get a variety of skills that you get to level up over time, and it's best just to level up your fighting skill as much as possible if you're a melee character, and get as many points immediately into your magic casting ability if you're a spellcaster. I do enjoy how some of the skills have weird names that you kind of have to figure out. It's, it's another aspect of the games to get you to really care about the game and pay attention to the world. It does it doesn't just say arcane magic or divine magic, it says things like theology for divine magic and theosophy for psionics. It also says kirijutsu, the art of killing, instead of critical strike, or ninjutsu instead of hiding in shadows. You really have to pay attention to the manual or you may not know what the heck they're talking about. There are a variety of other skills that you're going to have to get while playing the game, and making your characters and your party and leveling them up is always one of the most satisfying processes of playing an RPG game. And I think 
like this game has the depth and complexity and extraordinary variety to play the game in such an amazing number of ways that you can do it over and over again and setting it just the way you want it in that particular playthrough is extremely satisfying. I, I, I really, really love it in this game and I can do it over and over again. Combat in Wizardry 7 can be very, very challenging, especially compared to modern games. The Wizardry series does have a reputation of great difficulty, and even though this is probably the easiest of the Wizardry games up till that time, it was still very, very complicated, and you can get killed very easily if you do not pay attention to what's going on at all times. Combat is done through a first-person perspective, just like the rest of the game, and is turn-based, and the sheer variety of things that you can do while fighting can be very confusing, but it's also, like character creation, very interesting. The first three characters in your party are considered to be in the front row, and they can use melee attacks. The final three characters are considered to be in the back row, and they can use only extended reach weapons like spears or pole arms, bows and arrows or crossbows, and spells. So typically you're going to have your frontline melee fighters up front, and your squishy spellcasters in the back. It's so much better having this this way than it is in the Might and Magic games where everyone is just out in front and your spellcasters can get demolished really quickly. It's just kind of ridiculous seeing that happen in those games. It, it makes so much more sense here. You can choose from a variety of different attack types, such as swinging or thrusting, bashing, and each of those things does something a little bit different. It may change the amount of damage that you do, change your two-hit roll, or change your ability to penetrate an enemy's armor. It's especially important for melee characters to find weapons that have the melee option, because the melee option, even though it severely hurts your chance to hit and chance to penetrate armor, it actually has a chance of doing double damage, which is almost always better. The other, the the fact that you lose that to hit and to penetrate often really doesn't matter at all. Just the ability to do that much damage is vastly more important. So finding weapons like two-handed swords, the Zweihander, the Flamberge, the Nodachi that can do that is really, really important and something you should look for very quickly. Spells come in a variety of forms. There's the standard support spells that would haste you, which increases your initiative, slows the enemy, which decreases their initiative, heal wounds, which is all important, cure paralysis, cure poison, sane mind, etc. And also also the offensive spells. These offensive spells come in three types. There's ones that damage just a single enemy, ones that damage enemies in one stack, and ones that damage all the enemies on screen in all of the stacks. On the combat screen, you'll see that the enemies are listed below in the middle. They can come in a variety of different stacks, that is, groups of enemies, to fight. Sometimes you'll just face one enemy, sometimes you'll face a couple of dozen, because there are tons of them in, in a variety of stacks. Typically, you can only target one stack per round, but much later on in the game, you're going to get those spells where you can target everyone on screen, like Nuclear Blast, or Asphyxiation, or Mind Play. And you can just watch as dozens of enemies instantly die, to this hugely powerful spell you've just cast, and that's really cool. Unfortunately, in Wizardry 6 and 8, I think that for some reason or another those spells didn't really work as well. You were kind of already towards the end of the game at that point by the time you got such powerful spells. Either that or the enemies had such stunning magic resistance at the time that the enemies really couldn't be damaged by magic and you just had to rely on melee. But in Wizardry 7, you can get tons of damage with these area effect weapon of mass destruction type spells, and they are amazing. It's key to get a mage or a bishop in the party. Bishops are mixtures of the mage and priest class and can get spells from both of them, however they level up much more slowly. Psionicists and alchemists can also do damage with arcane spells, but they have their own unique little spell list and it's not as impressive as the mage or bishops. This is going to be your bread and butter attack against groups of enemies. Mages are useful for fighting groups of mediocre to weak enemies, whereas you're really going to need to rely on melee fighting in order to destroy single, large, powerful enemies that are almost certainly immune to most magic. There's such a huge variety of options to go through on the combat screen, it's hard to know where to begin. If you're a monk, a bard, a ninja, or a rogue, you get the Hide in Shadows ability, which allows you to attempt to hide from enemies during combat, which means that you can get sneak attack damage from them if you choose to attack them, and you can't be targeted by melee attacks. Although you can still be targeted by spells, so if somebody throws a fireball at you, you're gonna die. Probably the biggest predicament that you'll have while playing the game is choosing when to rest and for how long. 
You see, after battle, when your guys are wounded, they're not going to regenerate health by resting. You only can regenerate health by using healing magic or special artifacts. And those artifacts are rare and you're not likely to have them most of the time, and certainly not for all characters. Hiding in shadows is unfortunately not necessarily the best skill in the game because it takes a little time in order to build up the ability. And quite a few enemies have the ability to just see through it and you fail hiding in shadows, especially if they're really tough enemies. Although if you get it up to a very high level it can be useful, I just found it kind of uh, unnecessary, just sort of a waste of a turn. But you can get a ton of extra backstab damage and it does allow you to attack even if you're in the back row. It makes thieves and bards and ninjas a lot more versatile. There are a bunch of other things you can do based on your class. For instance, if you are a bard, you can get musical instruments and get an unlimited number of casts of certain spells based on playing those instruments. And there are just such a huge variety of spells to use. I especially love or Asphyxiation, which makes all creatures on screen make a saving throw versus death, and if they fail, they instantly suffocate. And of course, Mind Flay, which badly damages all of the enemies, but also has a chance of turning them insane if they survive. So even if they live, they're being insane and much more vulnerable. There's a word of death that the priest can get. The priests don't really have much in the way of offensive spells, but the ones they do get, like word of death, that's really, really useful. And I got it earlier than I got any other area of effect spell, like mind flare or nuclear blast. So the fact that I got that so much earlier was really cool and very useful. There are also some amazing spells like conjuration and create life, which allows you to summon creatures. And and unfortunately, some of the summoned creatures that you get are not that great. They're like demons or sphinxes that cast spells, but they cast spells against enemies, whether you want them to or not, against enemies that have such a high magic resistance, they're essentially useless. So really the conjuration spell, depending on what you get, and it's random depending on what power level you use. They can be really useful or they can be useful for damaging enemies, but more likely they'll be useful as a meat shield to take hits instead of your party. And that can be absolutely game-changing when you get that, and multiple classes can get the conjuration ability. Eventually your characters that are sort of dual fighter spellcasters, like the Lord, Valkyrie, or Samurai, can build up their spellcasting ability and be really, really versatile in combat and do tons and tons of damage themselves, which is very useful if you're confronted by huge numbers of enemies. It's better to use a fireball, even if your melee attack is better, it's only going to hit a, sm a small number of people, compared to something that targets an, an entire stack of enemies. Eventually, towards the end of the game, I kind of found that the spellcasters were less useful than the fighter or warrior type characters, like the samurai and the valkyrie, because they can deal out a guaranteed huge amount of damage. We're talking about 30, 40, or 50 per attack, and they get multiple attacks per round, so they can dish out a ton of punishment, whereas it was much dicier to use the spellcasters because it was more likely for their spells just to fail against an enemy and not penetrate their spell resistance. There are a few spells that you can get that are meant to do a huge overwhelming amount of damage against one enemy rather than target a mass of enemies, and these can actually be pretty impressive, like Deep Freeze can generally get a hundred points of damage against an enemy, which is pretty good. Of course, you can get a variety of protection spells. Some of them, like Armor Plate, Enchanted Blade, and Magic Screen, you can cast before battle. And it's essential when you're wandering around dangerous areas to always keep those things up. If they're not up, you're going to be in serious danger when you get into the battle, because you're not going to have time to cast them. Something about this game's combat is that they really encourage you to visit an overwhelming amount of stunning, sudden force. A kind of blitzkrieg at the very beginning that just demolishes his enemies, because the more time you spend in combat, the greater the danger to your party. It's really encouraged to destroy your enemies as swiftly as possible. It's not really meant to be a grind fest. You're not really supposed to spend a long time gruelingly fighting enemies, or else you'll take so much damage and have so many status effects put on you, you're not going to be able to win. Some of the protection spells, like Fire Shield and Anti-Magic, are things that you have to cast during battle, and sometimes it's much better to work on these first to sort of get your party strong enough to survive, especially if you're fighting enemies later in the game who have lasers. 
Yeah, you fight against robots in this game who have devastating laser attacks that Fire Shield can prevent against, so... When you choose to cast a spell, you have to choose its power level from 1 to 7. And depending on the spell, this changes the effects. Usually it just means doing more damage, but it could also mean for the defensive spells, keeping those spells cast over your characters for a longer duration. The higher the power level of the spell, the harder it is to cast it without the spell fizzling. Occasionally you can try to cast something and it'll say that the spell fizzled, which means you lost all of the spell points and nothing happened, which can be really frustrating. Although that can happen to enemies as well, so it's a two-way street. Choosing the exact right power level for your spell is an essential part of the game and adds a lot of variety and just makes you question what you're doing. Should I hang on to these spell points and save them for later, or do I have to go all out and use the most powerful spell blast I can get? A really annoying thing about combat is that you have to be very careful if you're going to cast a spell, because once you set it to be cast, it's going to be cast no matter what you do, even if all of the enemies on screen are dead. That's right, it follows Final Fantasy 1 style rules. So if you order a character to cast that fireball spell, it doesn't matter if everything is already dead, he's going to cast it. It just doesn't make sense. Is he just casting it into the ether? Why? What is the point? You just waste spell points. It just forces you to be unnecessarily careful about what you're going to do. I mean, wouldn't he stop if everyone was already a corpse? Wouldn't he just not cast it? Why are they doing it if they're already freaking dead? <laughs> And like with all of the wizardry games, status effects make a major impact on combat, and there are a ton of them. From blindness, to irritation, to insanity, and these are probably the most serious things that you have to worry about while playing. I, I, I mean it, more even than the damage the enemies do or the health they have. You need to worry about whether you're being inflicted with all of these horrible like status effects like poison, and I need to strongly emphasize here, get the cure poison spell as soon as possible. In this game, poison is crazy. It is absolutely nutty. You can get poisoned by a variety of enemies, and you're poisoned often for dozens and sometimes hundreds of rounds. You can get poisoned over and over again. You can get poisoned for over 200 rounds. I don't, I don't even know if there's a limit about how long you can be poisoned for, and doing that essentially means death. There is really nothing you can do about it, because even your cure poison spell that your character can cast, even if they cast it at max level, is not going to take off more than a few dozen rounds of that poison, so you know, you're know you poisoned for 150 rounds instead of 200 rounds. The poison will gradually eat away at your health and kill you unless you have a cure poison potion, and even then you may need multiple cure poison potions to fully get rid of the poison. A lot of the time when you play this game, if you get poisoned, you simply have to reload. It's like it's like dying. You simply have to save before every battle and then reload afterwards, because if you're poisoned, your character is essentially dead. And it gets even worse than that, because if you try to resurrect a character when they're poisoned, after they have died, they're resurrected and they're alive once again, ready to fight. But, get ready for this, they're still poisoned. Your priest has the ability to call forth the heavens, the power of the gods themselves, to rewrite history and bring your character back from the land of Thanatos, but you're still poisoned somehow. The poison still remains in your carcass during the resurrection process, and you can die once again from poison. Death! We are surrounded by it! It's absolutely crazy. I hate poison in this game, and I can understand how in some games, like Neverwinter Nights for instance, poison is kind of meaningless, because it really doesn't do very much to the character, it doesn't eat away at your health, it just destroys your strength. And there are so many antidote potions to the poison that you can buy right from the beginning of the game, and they're very cheap. So I can see both sides, you know, poison shouldn't be meaningless, but it shouldn't be this grindingly, brutally terrible. Among the other status effects, the enemies that can paralyze you and turn you insane are are the most dangerous. When you're paralyzed, you are much easier to hit, and enemies can just demolish you if that happens. It's also, like with the other wizardry games, very difficult to cure someone on the fly in the middle of a battle. And your characters are going to get these afflictions from enemies, usually en masse. 
So it's not like one character is typically going to be paralyzed, but two, three, four, maybe even in the entire party are going to be paralyzed at once. And even if you're lucky enough to have the character with the cure paralysis spell not paralyzed, and that almost never happens, ironically that guy is almost the first to get paralyzed it seems, you're still not going to be able to do it effectively because each round he could only de-paralyze one person, and that's if he has enough spell points to do that. These status effects are absolutely savage, and sometimes you're just going to have to quit and reload the game if you get affected by one of them. And that's not even the bad status effects. I mean, poison is bad, but the real bad ones are stone, which converts your character into a statue. I guess you just duct tape him to the back of your backpack and carry him around with you forever afterwards. How does a cure stone potion work exactly? Now, I mean, you can't ingest it, obviously. Do they just, like, drizzle it over the statue? Is that, is that what they do? I, I guess, right? And disease. Both of these things have their own particular cure spell or potion that you need to get in order to cure them. And they're not exactly cheap and they're not exactly common. And if someone gets stoned in the middle of a dungeon and the only way to get unstoned is by finding a potion that's miles and miles away and would take forever to get to, again, you're basically going to have to reload the game. Be especially careful around disease. I happen to be diseased early on in the game because, of course, because this is Wizardry 7, you can get the most fearsome status effect that it is virtually impossible to cure very early in the game, in the first area, within a few hours of booting up the game. And my character, I saved the game stupidly because I didn't realize how serious disease was, and my character was essentially dead from that point on. Disease does not get better. There is no waiting it out. You have to cure it. It actually gets worse over time, unlike even poison, and eventually your character is going to be stoned and dead because of the disease. I think there might be a way to go to the healer in town, and if you give him literally all of your gold, you might be able to cure, I hope. But if you can't, that's just an unacceptable part of this game. I mean, disease really shouldn't exist, at least at this level of the game. You shouldn't be able to stumble across it in the first town like I did. This game and its combat is pretty darn brutal. And if things don't go your way, you can choose to execute an intelligent and well-planned tactical withdrawal in order to regroup. Bravely ran away, away. Haunted us! When danger reared its ugly head, he bravely turned his tail no. and his brave so love and turned about. I did it! He chickened out. Weirdly enough, when you run during combat, the game actually physically moves your party several squares away from the fight. It's kind of odd to see. The number and type of monsters that you fight is extremely varied, and probably far more varied than even in Wizardry 8. There are these horrible ratkin creatures that can uh, cause poison, of course. Some of these ratkin, by the way, are ninjas or ronin ratkin, and they can get critical hits, which means that the character they attack, no matter their health, is instantly killed. So that's a lot of fun. You can also fight a variety of different dragons and giants, sea monsters, horrible sharks and fish. All of the different races that are in the game, the, like the Trang and the Umpani can be fought, the Helizoids, these women that are racing around in these weird hover cars, a variety of different wildlife such as birds. There are a lot of birds to fight. There are tons of undead, there are demons, all of which have their own particular attacks and ways that you have to deal with them. And they look absolutely amazing. The pixel art is definitely superior to the crummy, primitive 3D graphics in Wizardry 8. This uh, is, you know, it still holds up 30 years later. It looks fantastic. Even though they have only a very limited little animation there, I still think they look great. The toughest enemies in the game, I would probably say, are the Savant's Guards. The high-level versions of these guys can cause the dreaded paralysis and also insanity effects, which are absolutely deadly to you and your party, because they can cause party members to attack each other. You know, if your ultra-powerful samurai is suddenly able to swing his sword at your weak fairy mage, then she's gonna go down pretty darn quickly because she only has 20 or 30 hit points. Combat can be very, very trying and extremely difficult, especially early on, especially if you haven't imported a game from Wizardry 6. Your party is very weak. For maybe the first 10 hours of the game, your party is frighteningly weak and you need to save before everything 
every single fight. Every time you walk through a door, there could be a fight in a dungeon or in, or in a town, and you have to save the game just in case. Because there really is no way to plausibly resurrect characters with any frequency. You do get, early on in the game, in the starter dungeon, a amulet that allows you to resurrect people a few times. It only has a small number of charges, I think five or six. So, you know, if your entire party goes down, or except for one person, you really just, again, you have to save before a fight and reload. You can get a resurrection spell as well, much, much later on in the game, but it doesn't really feel practical unless there's an extremely brutally difficult fight that you just barely squeak your way through and have a couple of your characters die. You may want to just eat the resurrection there rather than reload because you're frightened if you do reload, you're going to lose the fight if you try it again. Uh, this also has extremely brutal rules surrounding resurrection. If you're resurrected, you actually permanently lose one point of vitality, and that's pretty darn serious, and you don't want to do that. So in general, resurrection is there as a last ditch, maybe, if you absolutely have to, but for the most part, you can't really resurrect your character. Overall, the combat in Wizardry 7 is amazing, and my favorite of any RPG system of the time. It's exciting, engaging, and sometimes difficult to choose exactly what you need in the moment, and there's so much complexity and depth to it. You can spend a long time trying to figure out how to get really, really good at this system. And of course, it should go without saying at this point, it's very, very challenging. At the beginning of the game, you can have an entire party get wiped out pretty darn fast. So you have to learn quick how to best manage your combat skills and abilities. It always keeps you on your toes. Really, even up until the very end of the game, you never really get relaxed into your combat. It's always something that you have to think about, always something that challenges you, and always something that's really fun and engaging. It's one of the best combat systems I've ever played, and it really just helps you pull yourself into this world and care about the world around you and just draw you farther and farther into it. Combat is something you're going to be doing again and again and again. It's always exciting and always challenges you. Your inventory screen is way more sophisticated than it was in Wizardry 6, and it's a lot more mouse-friendly, although it's a little confusing knowing exactly where to cl click if you don't read the manual. For instance, you have to click on the shield to figure out what your stats are, are. Sounds more like something you should click on a book for, but never mind. The lower right hand corner is to cast a spell. The bag in the background is in order to open your swag bag, which are the items that are not equipped right on you to use in battle, but you have to pull out of the bag, and you just drag and drop items over the armor if you want to equip them. It is still irritating that each individual character has their own individual inventory. I mean, it just seems so pointless to have to dig through each separate character's inventory. I, I, I just, I can't stand doing that. There's no point to it. There was never a point to it. It's not just Wizardry 7 that did this. A lot of games did. It's just irritating. You only get a fairly small amount of stuff to carry around in the game, which is going to be a big problem after a while because it'll be stuffed full of things and you don't know what to do with them. And it's not like it's weapons or armor, it's important objects that you don't necessarily know where you need to use them. And if you leave it way back in town, throughout the game you're going to get a ton, and I mean a ton, of these weird items with question marks next to them. Some of them are fairly clear as to what they are, but others have vague descriptions, and all of them have mysterious uses. You see, Wizardry 7 has a very heavy point-and-click adventure game kind of feel, where you have to find random items and try them out in all sorts of weird circumstances to figure out what you're supposed to do with them. And unfortunately, unlike in a lot of point-and-click adventure games, you're not going to get them immediately prior to when you're going to use them. You see, you could potentially get them 50 or 60 hours before you need to use them, and you'll just have to either carry them around with you or leave them behind in the hub area and collect them later when you need them. The problem with that is, you don't necessarily know when you're going to need them and can work your way all the way into the depths of a dungeon and realize at the last minute that you need them, have to exit the dungeon, go all the way back out through tons of random encounters, get the item you think you need, go all the way back in the dungeon, and see if you have to use it there. It can be really, really frustrating, and that's when you know you may need an item and you just perhaps forgot it. The limited inventory space seems like a legacy of this game's dungeon crawler roots from the early 80s. 
and you can't really just easily leave the items on the ground. There, there's no chest in this game. It would be great if you had, like in Diablo 2, just an inventory chest where you can dump this stuff in case you need it later. You have to just drop this stuff on the ground, and when you go back to pick it up, you have to pick up everything else that you left there first before you get to that. So if there are 10 or 15 or 20 items there, you have to rummage through all of them, and that's if you have enough space to even keep them until you get to the item you need. It's very frustrating, it adds very little to the game, and it probably shouldn't be there. But just know that if you go into this game, you're probably going to have to go through some nonsense with the inventory. There is a weight limit that each of your characters has, but that comes up very, very rarely. Your carrying capacity is really more the spaces you're limited to, not the weight that you can carry. Only in extreme circumstances here and there is your weight going to be too high. Occasionally in the game, you will get some text that pops up, some dialogue that fills in a little bit about the story, about how your character should feel, and to build atmosphere. One of the best moments here is when you stare out across the ocean in New City and feel the darkness, the oppressiveness, and also the longing and the wonder calling out to you to engage in this adventure. The great sea of sorrows spans before you like a vast and dense space flattened unto the sky, spreading into the far distant horizon as a desolate plain shimmering ether. Its deep waters chant a thousand silent tales, and its unseen borders but hint of far distant lands. How universal such a compelling motion, as if behind every veil of boundless unknown, lay cloaked an invisible beacon, endlessly calling. Such solace these sights bring, as if a reminder that though the trappings of mortal man be forever enshrouded in a sea of passing discords, he has but to open his eyes that he may bear witness to some greater existence of which he is only a momentary trap. It's a beautiful moment, and this really helps the game get a Dungeons & Dragons kind of feel. More so than any game I've ever seen that's based on Dungeons & Dragons, even the later Baldur's Gate-style games or the Gold Box games, all of which are set in official Dungeons & Dragons universes, these little text boxes that come up in Wizardry 7 perfectly encapsulate the flavor text that a dungeon master will give you while you're playing the game. And when they pop up, it really feels exactly like you're in the middle of adventure, around a table with your friends, and the DM is telling you something, it's explaining the world, it's giving you this tiny little tidbit of information, of storytelling that you can expand upon, and the prose there really makes you feel something, it's very evocative. This is the pinnacle in some ways of RPG gaming back then, just that little hint of what's happening around you that your mind can play on for later, and Wizardry 7 does that beautifully at multiple occasions. Eventually, if you survive survive enough in New City, you may find your way to Professor Wonderland, a Ratkin scholar who explains something to you about the world. You learn that New City was once a hub area for all of the races in the land. All of them lived together here and built this beautiful place so, so that they could survive and work together in peace. However, quarrels broke out, violence ensued, and the town was eventually abandoned after it was destroyed, giving the player a sense of mystery and overall of sadness. This is a very sad city and a very depressing game at times. If you can get Professor Wonderland to talk to you, he'll explain that there's a special area underneath the city where you potentially could find a map. And that's where you learn about the ultimate goal that you're going to be getting into when you play this game. You see, the quest that you have to go on is to find a series of maps. Each one of these maps is going to give you a hint about how to play the game, about where to go, what to do, how to get through a magic door, and where eventually you can find something called the Astral Domine. You can also find a prison in New City, and inside that prison is your ticket to get into the next area, the Gorn Castle. After you free someone inside of the prison who's being held captive by the Dark Savant's minions, he will give you a special letter and instruct you to go to the Gorn Castle and meet one of the lords there. And that's when you really set out on your adventure. You truly end up on an epic journey in this game. 
Once you end up eventually leaving New City, you're going to find your way towards an amazing set of locations, including the Gorn capital. The Gorn are these orc-like creatures with a surprisingly East Asian-style influence on them, whose empire has fallen to rot, has fallen to ruin. And you have to explore the desolate, civil war-torn kingdom of the Gorn, and you really get to hear the despairing message of the Gorn king, and the dreadful fate he sees foredoomed on his own people. Once you leave there, you can go to the realm of Monk Harama, which is another area with a very East Asian style to it. The monks are a group of religious men who fight with a martial arts style. They also wax philosophical about ridiculous things that may make absolutely no sense whatsoever, or may be the key to ultimate wisdom. As you explore the land of the monks, you have to go through a bizarre sort of initiation ritual in order to join them. It's a really fun part of the game where you're told not to go go into the Black Abyss door. But in order to join the monks, you have to go in there. You have to go into the place they explicitly forbade you from going, and you have to bring a special item in there, namely a pipe and pastel, and, well, do drugs, and that helps you escape this psychedelic mystical experience. So the game is teaching you kids, just do drugs and you'll be okay. After leaving the land of the monk, you can explore the cities of the Trang and the Umpani. The Trang are portrayed almost like xenomorphs, uh, spreading their seed and their colonies and the Zerg creep, destroying the environments on any planets they colonize. They're also creepy and disgusting, but they're quite intelligent and willing for you to join them to help the Trang achieve their goals. They live in this desolate, ruined city called Nyctalinth, and there's an evil graveyard filled with ghosts inside of it. When you go to the Umpani, they have actually reconstructed one of the ruined cities there. But the Umpani, this militaristic race of rhino men, have actually managed to somehow restore the buildings in this area and are living in them, and you go through their strange militaristic culture. And you can join their side too, or sort of play both sides against the middle, or just attack both of them immediately and not bother with any of them. Eventually, you also make your way to the Tower of the Dane. Neither of these sides, by the way, is good or evil. That doesn't really exist here. The Dark Savant is sort of menacing and sinister, but everyone else isn't really good or bad. They're just sort of all part of the grand scheme of trying to find a way to get their own side to victory as quick as they possibly can, and they're willing to kill anyone who gets in their way. The Dane look a heck of a lot like the Arcane from the Spelljammer setting of Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, and they're also sort of a mystical race of wizards, kind of like the Arcane were. And you go through their strange, evil wizard tower and explore and learn, and they're trying to summon a demon, and you have to help them. And you get to go into the grand palatial room of the Magna Dane, the leader of their order, and see this dissolute lifestyle they're living in there. Eventually, you actually get to cross the ocean. You have to figure out a way, through a very confusing set of events, by the way, to enter into a room in New City, the hub area, and once you get into this special room there, you can find a boat, and you have to figure out how to power the boat, but once you do, you're on your way across the ocean, and you have to actually have to cross it in the boat and fight sea monsters along the way. You really get a sense in this game of the great length and breadth of travel that you go on, kind of like some in the Ultima series where you get to go across the entire land of Britannia or Might and Magic where you get to go to all the different areas of the continent you're on. Once you cross this area, you can find the Dragon Caves, and then later on, the City of the Helizoid, this amazingly advanced race of women who are involved in trying to find the Astral Domine along with the Hagardi, who show up in Wizardry 8. Unfortunately, it's at this part of the game where some of the more complicated and confusing puzzle elements come into play, and you have to really pay attention. If you didn't go to a secret area earlier in the game near the City of the Umpani, and figure out a secret way of getting to see a Sphinx who gives you a magic object, you're never going to be able to go into another secret area over here. If you just totally missed that, and it's pretty easy to miss it by the way, you're completely going to be in the dark and it's very confusing about what you're supposed to do. But if you can figure it out, you're going to go in a, in an amazing adventure across oceans and forests and dungeons and all kinds of places, and it really is an amazing quest that you end up on. Navigating the world is done from a first-person blobber, as they call it, perspective, 
And this is really one of the biggest, most challenging, and most complicated games I've ever played. And I would not blame anyone if they consulted a walkthrough frequently, if not constantly, while playing it for the first time. It is so confusing and so difficult to figure out what you're doing that unless you set aside weeks or months of your time, or you're the smartest person who's ever lived, you're never going to be able to do it. In other words, there's going to be a lot of trial and error, and that error means total party death start over from their save game. There's death from poison, death from stoning, death from disease, death from terrible magical traps that go off when you open a chest, death from horrible insectoid creatures from outer space, death from dragons, death from giants, death from lizards, death from birds, death from beetles, death from hideous tree monster things with weird noses, death from drowning, death from falling while climbing. Death stalks you at every turn, so... Ah! That's only the cat. Oh. Ah, death! That's Maggie again, Grandpa. Oh, where were we? Death! In other words, it's really easy to die, and you have to be very, very careful, very, very patient, and very much willing to reload quite, quite often while playing this game. You need to save your game after every single fight and before and after doing almost anything. Now, admittedly, most of the fights in the game are actually not random. They are set encounters that you're going to find at specific points. So once you take care of them, you really just have the random encounters to worry about and can navigate the area much more freely, but that really doesn't matter too much because those random encounters are pretty darn high anyway. In the town of New City, you quickly learn a number of things, and you start to figure out what you're supposed to do in the game. Oh, well, you kind to figure that out. You learn that there are some sort of strange creatures called the Kuisaka, or the Savant's Guards, and you learn they work for some sort of strange creature called the Dark Savant. These creatures are evil, weird, and they are found throughout the game, holed up in different cities, and they're obviously up to something sinister and unpleasant. So figuring out where you exactly need to go can be very, very complicated. This game not only does not hold your hand, it actually throws you out into traffic, and tells you not to get hit. Probably the worst area in the game is known as the Fun House, and the Ratkin Ruins are on top of it. And this is really the first part of the game after the first couple of areas where it actually gets difficult. And I know that may sound crazy because I made the other stuff sound really difficult, but this is where it just gets unfair, I would say. In order to get into the Ratkin Ruins, you have to kill a series of these strange tree men creatures, and they are extremely difficult with some very high-level monsters monsters that can easily wipe out your entire party. You really just have to get lucky or hope that you've been leveling a lot up till this point. After you do this, and as long as you brought a secret item from the Gorn City and know what to do exactly in that place with that secret item, there's a lot of ifs here. If you manage to do that, you can gain access through the trees to the Ratkin Ruins. The Ratkin arrive in swarms. I mean, huge numbers of, the, of Ratkin are here, and it's not that individual they're particularly hard, it's just that there are so darn many of them, and this is before you get your Weapon of Mass Destruction spells, so you have to just laboriously take out huge numbers of them. Some of the Ratkin, called the Ratkin Ronin, by the way, are essentially ninjas who have the critical strike ability, and they can instantly kill a character, no matter what their health is, so, you know, so that's a lot of fun. But once you actually get through it and get into the Funhouse, that's where the party really begins, because inside the Funhouse you find this massively heavy Heavy weight, and it weighs like a huge amount, so much so that it's going to overburden virtually any party member you have, and you have to carry that around with you. You also, in this area, find another gigantic weight, not quite as heavy, called a lodestone. And this is where you realize that the people that designed this game were not just tough, they were evil. Because this lodestone is a literal lodestone. Yeah. It has no function. It's, it looks just like one of the other dozens of little weird items that have no apparent function until you find out, you know, 20 hours later that maybe you actually needed this object. It seems just like that, but no, there's no point to it. And I don't mind telling you this, because you should know this. Don't pick up this lodestone and carry it around with you for hours and hours. It has literally no meaning. If you went through the game in the past carrying this around for 20 or 30 or 40 or the entire game, I really feel for you and I can see how angry you'd get. Isn't it a funny joke that they did? Isn't it so funny that they played this joke on everyone who's playing the game? <laughs> 
<laughs> it's so amusing. And this is where the game really becomes a point-and-click adventure game, just with randomized battles mixed in, because you have to figure out this increasingly complicated series of events where just like you're playing Secret of Monkey Island or something, you have to pick up weird objects and use them somewhere else and figure out that you need to use this other object in order to get to this place, and it's so confusing, it doesn't make any sense. And even if you're following a walkthrough, it's really, really confusing, and there's trial and error between different points. Like, you have to press a lever and then go find out if this river leads you to the correct area and if it doesn't you have to go all the way back crawling through a ton of the dungeon and then hit another lever and see if that one takes you where you want to go. It's a nightmare. It really, really is a nightmare and this is the point of the game where I actually consider kind of quitting it but the rest of the game is really, really worth it and I highly recommend it with the exception of the Fun House area which I, I, I think it's safe to say that that's an ironic name, Fun House. You really just feel like you're exploring exploring the entire landscape of this world, and it, it, it really gives you a sense of grandeur and scope. Unfortunately, Wizardry 7 does have some serious issues around traversing the world. They added in some new dungeoneering elements, I guess you could say, that weren't in Wizardry 6 in order to go across harsh landscapes, and this can be a really complicated, boring, tedious aspect to the game. What should have been a fun, exciting addition of new exploration elements actually ends up just being the worst part of the game imaginable. You see, they added swimming and climbing in Wizardry 7. Swimming is one of the more irritating things in Wizardry 7. There are some squares on the maps that are water squares, and if, if you have no swimming ability at all in your skills, you're instantly just going to be drowned. There's nothing you can do about it. You just die immediately. Your entire party can get wiped out that way. So what you have to do in order to train your party to swim is gradually bump up their skill points when you level up, which means that you have to avoid leveling up other things, which is really annoying, things that may be more useful for combat, and you have to level them up maybe to about 20 out of 100, which will take a few levels early on. And once you get up to that point, you can gradually begin going on water squares without instantly dying and moving off, moving Moving on, moving on, resting, 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 moving on, moving off, and gradually leveling up your swimming ability. And there's a special area in one of the dungeons where you can do this with a little bit more safety. And this is just agonizingly boring, because you just need to sit there, sometimes literally for hours, practicing swimming. But you have to spend all of this boring, dull, dreary time doing this nonsense. It's so irritating. It's, it's boring. And I, I do literally mean hours if you want to level up the safe way without risking your party dying. And remember, every time you go on a water square, it eats up stamina. So you can't just go on and off and on and off. You have to go on, hope that you live, go off, then rest all your stamina up. And remember, if you rest, that means you could get into a random encounter, which is a, a ton of fun. So this all adds up to so much time and effort just to be able to swim. It's ridiculous. In Wizardry 6, you did have to go across water squares, but it's because you went on a quest to find a magic item that allowed you to do it. You didn't have to go through this tedious process of learning how to swim. The same thing has to be done with climbing. You have to go to areas where you can climb and climb up and climb down, climb up, climb down, and you need to get your skill in order to get to a certain area up to like a hundred to the max level, and again, it's going to take like an hour or more to do this. It's just tedious, it's crazy, and it's really, really obnoxious. There's another area, by the way, in the game where you can train up your ability to avoid being hit by insanity or other mind-controlling effects, and it's the same thing, hours and hours and hours of moving back and forth on one square. This is terrible game design, and it just can't be excused away. Interactions with NPCs are very confusing. I mean, they're quite complicated if you don't know what you're doing. When you encounter an NPC, sometimes it's a normal encounter like you'd experience in any other game. You can talk to them or barter with them for stuff. It seems pretty normal. But sometimes when you encounter an enemy, depending on their mood and a variety of factors, they may actually be hostile towards you. And you're going to get this screen where it says to use a spell, truce, or a variety of other things, 
and you have to really know what you're doing or screw something up badly and potentially kill someone who you want around for later on. There's a skill in the game called Diplomacy, and it's kind of irritating to level it up because it means that you have to not level up something else. Just trying to level up this Diplomacy can take quite a while. And if you have a high Diplomacy, that means that when you talk to one of these characters you're trying to be peaceful with, it's easier to get them to that stage. But while you're trying to make peace with them, sometimes they can just get angry out of nowhere and attack or run away. It can be very, very difficult and, and, and it's just, you know, puzzling to figure out what you're supposed to do here if you're just starting out the game. It's a very different experience than most other RPG games. You can also bribe enemies with large amounts of gold and cast a spell on them called Charm to try to affect things. This especially is important if you've become hostile to other creatures. So if you kill an Umpani, for instance, another Umpani character in the game who's a traitor will be hostile to you and hate you and be really, really angry. And he's very, very useful, this character, so it can be very dangerous to attack certain NPCs because their entire race is going to turn against you. The whole faction is against you now. If you kill some ratkin, the rest of the ratkin are going to hate you. Some of the creatures also respond to the mysterious karma stat. Karma doesn't really have any effect on combat, which is, makes it uh, kind of useless, except when you're actually talking to NPCs, because some of them, the sort of dastardly, thievish rogue people, like people with low karma, and the ones that are more friendly and nice, like people with high karma. So which one of your party members is talking with them can make make the difference between whether they'll like you and be friends or try to kill you. The game also uses a text parser system, which automatically makes it better, in my opinion, than most modern games, because you have to type in, again, kind of like a point-and-click adventure game sometimes, what you want to say to someone. You have to choose what you want to ask them about, and that can be a little bit tricky. Figuring out exactly what it is that they want is not always easy, and you kind of have to ask everybody about everything, just in case they have some information you might need about a weird object you have no idea how to use, or where to go, or what to do, and it's fun just finding out what all of the different races think of the other races, because we find out in the game that everyone is allied with someone else. Eventually, you're going to come to the point in the game where you have to make decisions about whether people live or die. Now, you don't actually have to do this in order to complete the game, but there are points where you can simply betray various factions and kill all the people there, which can get you some extra equipment, or some help from another faction that hated the one that you betrayed, or just tons of experience from the people that you're killing. Determining who you leave alive and who you kill can be very difficult, because sometimes you want to kill certain NPCs to get certain items, but you may want to avoid it for a while until later in the game, when you can reasonably expect to kill them and not have to worry about their friends coming to kill you. If you can just demolish anyone that tries to kill you, any assassins that come after you, then you're going to be alright. In fact, there's a great similarity here between Wizardry 7 and Fallout New Vegas, another one of the greatest RPGs ever made, because in that game you also have to choose whether you're going to betray certain factions at different points, and the same logic comes into play. Do you want to do this knowing that if you betray Caesar at this point, then he's going to start sending those horrifyingly tough assassins after you? That can be really dangerous, and you may want to wait a little bit and sort of prevaricate doing other things until you get to a point, maybe you have power armor or something, where you can really really fight back against him. Speaking of NPCs, it's a weird fact that once you discover certain NPCs, you're gonna suddenly find them wandering around various dungeons. You'll be walking around and get into an encounter and think, oh boy, I got another random battle I have to fight. But in reality, it's one of these NPCs that's wandering around and you have to talk to them and see what they want. And you can very usefully talk to them about certain things. And more importantly, you can trade with them. It's super, super useful to do this because you can trade any item to any of these NPCs that you're friendly with, and that means that even in the depths of a dungeon, when you're miles and miles away from town and it would take an extraordinarily large amount of time to get back, you can offload all the crap items you don't need onto these NPCs. Although I wonder how they got into some of these places, it doesn't really seem to make sense. Most especially the girl on the hover bike. I don't know how she's flying, you know, indoors on the hover bike. I don't quite grasp that, but, but never mind. It actually can get a little annoying sometimes because weirdly you encounter them over and over again for, for some inexplicable reason. You just, 
you know, encounter them every square or two until they wander away. It can actually be kind of irritating, but a little amusing too. You may have noticed that I'm not really talking much about the music in this game, and that's because it really doesn't exist. Well, not much of it anyway. Aside from a little bit at the opening and an incredibly annoying bit of music that plays every time you open the inventory, there really isn't much music to speak of, and generally I keep it turned off when I'm playing the game. However, that's just the perfect time for you to put on some of your favorite dungeon synth music, a special genre that was created to give you a kind of ambient background noise towards Dungeons & Dragons. Some of my absolute favorite things that might fit into that field are bands called Depressive Silence and Galdur. Galdur even made an album called Wizardry, and it's absolutely great. Some other albums include Ancient Woods by the band Eternal Fear, King of the Golden Hall by Jim Kirkwood, Ratten Koenig, who made Blind Obsessed with the Moon. There's also an amazing album from the early 90s called Black Aria by Danzig, which is kind of a dark symphonic album. It's really, really good. Glenn Danzig was in the punk band The Misfits and later Sam Hain in the 80s, and he's an amazing composer, and that album Black Aria was supposedly listened to by some of the creators and artists who were working on Advanced Dungeons & Dragons in the early 1990s, including the artist Tony D. Terlizzi, who is responsible for a lot of the most amazing Planescape art. So I think it's really worth listening to while you're playing the game, but otherwise it's just kind of an ambient, empty, a silent game, which kind of matches the world, sort of like how Dark Souls is very, very quiet. But if you don't want that oppressive silence, there's a plethora of things on the internet to turn on and listen to while playing the game to give yourself some background noise. Finding your way around this huge world is very, very confusing because there really is no in-game map. This is where I think modern games are really superior to older ones because this was done at a time period when it was considered much more normal for someone to design their own map for the game that they were playing on graph paper, which is where you would design most maps for a Dungeons & Dragons game you were playing. So you would play and map it out as you go. There are other games like The Legend of Grimrock which have tried to recapture that old school feel. There is a way to look at a map in the game, but it's very counter intuitive. You have to actually find and use an item called the Journey Map Kit, and you do have to find this item in the early parts of the game. You could theoretically miss it. And the fact that you have to actually go into your inventory to look at, it's kind of confusing and it really misses the point of just very quickly bringing up the map, orienting yourself, and then following the direction you want to go. So when I play the game, I almost always use a mod that gives you an auto map. So you play it in windowed mode, and next to it it auto-generates it's a map for you. Now, some people may think this is not the right way to play the game and I'm cheating and so forth, but this game is already so, so challenging. I, I can't imagine playing the game again the old-fashioned way without this map always there. It's actually sometimes hard to orient yourself even with the map, so not having it is just crazy, and I highly recommend that you download this very, very simple mod that completely changes the game and makes it much, much easier to just know where the heck you are and where you're going. Because this is an RPG game, you will naturally be finding treasure inside of chests, and you have to figure out a way to open them. Virtually every chest in the game is trapped in some way, and thieves, bards, and ninjas have a special skill that allows them to inspect chests and disarm traps. However, doing this is very, very complicated and overall rather unnecessary. You see, what you have to do here, even inspecting the trap, by the way, could set the trap off. And what the game does is it very confusingly gives you a set of letters that, based on your locks and traps skill, your character believes could form the words in the trap that is on the chest. And and based on that, you have to choose what type of trap you think it is, and then try to disarm it. All of this can go wrong, so it's it's very, very difficult. And it takes a long time to level this skill up, when you probably would want to level up other more important skills for that character. 
And most importantly, it really isn't all that necessary, because your mage characters can get a spell called Knock Knock. And Knock Knock is a fairly early level spell, and what the Knock Knock spell does is that it will give you a chance to instantly disarm a trap on a chest. Now it's probably better overall in terms of success to use a rogue to disarm a trap, but the Knock Knock spell is still fairly powerful and it will work on quite a few chests, even the higher level ones. And overall, it doesn't really matter because you're naturally going to be saving before you open any chest in the game, and if you get hurt or killed in the process, you're always going to reload. So you might as well just save and reload the type of trap on each chest is randomized, so every time you try to inspect something it's going to be a different type of trap, which means that if you get a really, really dangerous trap, like causing stone or something like that, then you would just naturally reload and start over again until you get a much better trap, like daggers or something like that. So unless you're averse to save scumming, and if you're playing Wizardry 7, you're, you're probably not averse to that, you might as well just save and reload and just take the hit from the trap in until you get something that you want, there really is no point to disarming them. Now, most of the chests in the game will tend to have some set items in them, one or two items that are always going to be in that chest, no matter how many times you open them. But the majority of items that you get are going to be randomized, which means that if you're going through a chest, you can save and reload, save and reload, and open it again and again and again until you get a really good item that you really want. And you can do this for an hour or more, just again and again and again until you get something amazing instead of the crap you got initially. Some people may think that this is cheating, but really I think it's the best way to play the game. So keep saving and reloading until you get something really, really good out of there. Speaking of save scumming, let's talk about resting. When you rest, you do restore stamina very quickly and spell points much more slowly, but you restore no health. That is simply not restored in any way, shape, or form while resting. The only way to restore health is by using spells. Naturally, that means that a major part Part of the game is determining how much resting you want to do, because of course every time you rest, you risk getting involved in a random encounter, versus how many spell points you have and how many spell points you want to recoup for the fights you want to be in next. And unlike Wizardry 6, where it was fairly easy in most areas of the game to rest fully and get plenty of spell points back, Wizardry 7 seems to have gone wildly off the rails with that, and it's very hard to rest fully. I would say almost impossible in most areas. So what you can do is rest a little bit, restore a little bit of your spell points, and then save the game, and then rest a little bit more, and if you don't get into a random encounter again, save the game, and so on and so forth until you do get into that random encounter, and then crucial use the terminate game function. Wizardry 7 didn't allow you to quit out of the game mid-combat, only after the combat was over. But in Wizardry 7, you can quit out of that combat right away, each turn. It does kind of force you to watch all your characters die, though, which is kind of strange, but I guess that's sort of the punishment for doing this, which means that you can very easily game the system and start over again before the battle was even fought. You can use save scumming in order to essentially recoup all of your spell points and thus all of your health from heal wounds, although this does feel a little bit more on the side of cheating. You do want random encounters to play some part in the game, and resting is a major reason why you get into random encounters in the first place. I just tend to do it sometimes because I think the amount of random random encounters that you get into is shockingly high, like way, way, way disproportionately high from where it should be, so I tend to save scum a little bit when I'm playing. Wizardry 7 allows you to import a game from Wizardry 6, and I highly recommend that if you play this game, you play Wizardry 6 first. I made the mistake recently of just starting out with Wizardry 7 to play through that, and oh my god, it's a completely different experience. If you complete Wizardry 6, you can import a party that has a bunch of really, really useful items especially amazingly good weapons or magical rings and amulets that totally change how you play the game. Now, you're not allowed to take absolutely everything with you from Wizardry 6, but you can take so much useful stuff, as many healing potions as you want, as many cure poison potions as you want, as many amulets of life that allow you to cast resurrection as you want. I brought three of those things with me from Wizardry 6. I didn't think they'd let me take them all, but they did. You can also bring a couple of 
powerful magical artifacts like the PK crystal for psionicists or the diamond ring for female characters that allow you to regenerate health. And that means you can switch back and forth with different female characters using the diamond ring and restore their health without using cure wounds, which completely changes how you play the game and makes it vastly easier. You can also bring in any of the powerful weapons that you want, although only one per character. But you can bring Excalibur, the best weapon in the entire series. You can bring the Blade Cuisinart, as I did, an incredibly powerful sword, the Muramasa Blade, the most powerful samurai sword, katana in the entire game. And with this extra stuff, suddenly everything falls into place. I would almost suspect that when they were designing Wizardry 7, and they were really basing the difficulty, the, the extreme severe difficulty of Wizardry 7, on the fact that you were importing things from the previous game and didn't really take into consideration people that were going to be starting Wizardry 7 just on its own. Some may also think this is kind of cheating, especially with the incredibly powerful weapons that allow you to steamroll through pretty much any enemy in the early area, but Wizardry 7 is so tough. I just think that this is absolutely necessary. You, you need to take proper steps to prepare yourself for this game, and playing through Wizardry 6 is one of those steps. Wizardry 7 was remade in the mid-90s as Wizardry 7 Gold, and it's a very, very different look and feel to the game where they modernize the graphics. I, I don't particularly like this version, I've never played it all the way through. I, I did show in the opening segment of this video the cutscenes from that game because it was a little bit more cinematic than the original DOS version, but uh, yeah, I, I was never terribly interested in that one and eh, it doesn't seem to have quite the same magic for me as the original. As you wander around the city, you learn that there are a variety of different groups within, and they all have opinions about everyone else. There's a group called the Monk, for instance, and they really, really don't like the Dane. There's a group called the Gorn, they seem to be sort of orcish and have had an ancient empire that's long since gone to pot. Sort of like pre-World War I Europe, everyone seems to have split into different coalitions, each with their own ideas about what they want to do and how they want to run things. And if they happen to run into a group that they're not allied with, they're automatic vicious enemies and it's violence between the two of them until death. Speaking of which, the actual goal that you're trying to get here is to find something called the Astral Domine. The Astral Domine is related to something that existed in Wizardry 6, the Cosmic Forge. The Cosmic Forge is the most powerful artifact in existence, a magical pen which allows you to write literally anything into and out of existence. And the Astral Domine is a key to finding where you can go to access the Cosmic Forge. Everyone wants it because it would be, mean not only power for themselves or for their race, it would mean the ultimate power in the entire universe. You would literally be a god and be able to command the past, present, future, everything in existence would all be yours to control. So everyone wants to find it. And of course, your adventuring party wants to find it too, because, well, why not? Who doesn't want ultimate power? In Wizardry 8, you can actually work together with both the Trang and the Umpani and get them to put aside their centuries-long war and work together against the Dark Savant. That really doesn't exist, however, in Wizardry 7. It's a much more realistic, gritty, and dark version of this world, where everyone is at each other's throats, and you have to face the realization that you have to screw somebody over in order to win. And one of the most interesting things about the game is that you're not the only one out there. You have to face the realization that you're not the grand, glorious, epic hero. You're just one adventurer amongst a host of adventurers and races and peoples trying to get out there and find these maps. It's sort of like that scene in Shaun of the Dead where, he, where Shaun finds out that his ex-girlfriend is actually running around with her own party of adventurers trying to fight the zombie plague. It's not just him. He's one story amongst a ton of other stories that are all happening in this disaster-ridden capital. And you can actually lose access to these maps if someone else in the world finds them before you do. You have to either buy it off of them or kill them and take it. And this can be really, really expensive. I mean, these are thousands and thousands of gold pieces for these maps, and some of these people are very difficult to find, and you more or less have to kill them when you get close to them, such as Don Barloni, the leader of those horrible ratkin. Rather than being the chosen one, it's a much more sophisticated look at the world, and it teaches you individual initiative. You are just a random group of adventurers, and you could easily die on your mission. Like, really easily die. And someone else is just going to take your place and do exactly what you were going to do. You have to 
actually compete with others. Some grand adventure isn't coming to you that you have to react to. You have to go out into the world and do something about it. The world of Guardia is a dark and desolate place. It's filled with ruined cities with dark streets, inhabited by furtive creatures wandering around engaged in some sort of military violence with one another. We really get a sense that this was perhaps a flourishing world a long time ago, but everything else is just sort of grim and unpleasant. Once you collect a bunch of the maps and the various objects you need in order to power the boat, you can eventually set across the Sea of Sorrows and reach the city of the Helizoid. In there, you actually get a chance to get some super powerful equipment, which is really awesome, and talk to Heli, the queen of the Helizoids, and figure out a little bit more about this world and what exactly the Crusaders of the Dark Savant that it's mentioned in the title are. And you can also very crucially at this point discover a spaceship in the city of the Helizoids that belonged to Funzang, the weird godlike being that everyone in the galaxy seems to worship. It's also crucial at this point in the game that you go back to New City and remember that horribly difficult area that you never had a chance of getting into early in the game. Because if you go in there now that you have better equipment and more experience, you can kill the guards and discover what's inside, namely Vi Domina. Vi Domina is a young woman from another planet who's in the service of the Dark Savant, but she's beginning to realize that he's gone crazy and wants to seize all power in the galaxy for himself by getting the Astral Domine. But you can free her from his control, and she'll give you a special radio communication device to contact her on the spaceship. After setting your things in order, getting all of the equipment that you possibly need, and finding Funzang's spaceship, you can eventually make your way to the Tomb of the Astral Domine. And this is a really, really difficult dungeon, a series of dungeons in fact, starting with the Tomb of the Dead, then the Tomb of Gorers, which is a really fun area that really reminds me of the Final Fantasy VII Ruby and Emerald Weapon fights. There are a series of boss fights essentially here, some of which are extremely difficult, much more difficult than even the final boss like Ruby and Emerald Weapon are. And if you defeat them, then you can get some absolutely stunningly amazing armor and weapons and a huge amount of experience. Just a gigantic amount, but they're really, really hard. One of them has several thousand points of health, and one of them, the Fiend of Nine Worlds, I only recently beat while doing the playthrough to get footage for this video. That's how long it took me to beat this guy. He's a Ratkin who has some kind of special Vorpal Blade that'll routinely deal like 99 damage per swing, and it's unusual even at level 20 of your characters to have more than 150 or 200 health, and he also poisons you instantly for 250 rounds every attack he gets. So he's very, very, and it's really hard to actually hit him. It's almost impossible at first until you use Armor Melt, a spell that continually reduces the armor of an enemy. And eventually, I was finally able to beat him and get a gigantic amount of XP. There's also another enemy here called the Beast of a Thousand Eyes, and he's probably the most difficult boss in all of video game history, because you really need to be like level 90 to 100, and most characters characters can beat the game around level 20, so you have to level your characters to an insane, ridiculous degree in order to ever defeat this creature. I never really found much point in even trying, it's just incredibly difficult, and it's just a way to add a little bit more challenge in an already fantastically challenging game. After you leave the Tomb of Gorers, you can finally reach the Tomb of the Astral Domine, where Funzang hid this magical artifact millennia ago. And this is a really, really hard dungeon where you have to fight, believe it or not, robots. It was a really cool fact in Ultima, Might and Magic, and Wizardry that back in those days they mixed in all of this science fiction elements, like the last act of these games was all like a weird science fiction thing for some reason. And it's bizarre fighting these Transformers or Gobots who are really, really powerful powerful with their laser weaponry, by the way. And eventually, if you reach all of the special areas in the dungeon, you can unlock the final door and reach the Astral Domine itself, the magic key to all of the universe. When you get there, you can engage in the final boss fight against the Dark Savant, and it's really, really tough. But once you eventually defeat him, you can get Vi Domina to tell you that she knows that the Astral Domine is telling her where to get to a special planet. That's the planet of Dominus, which we go to in Wizardry 8. And then we go through a final sequence where we can choose to leave the planet with the Trang, the Umpani, or with Vi Domina. It's obviously, I think, a lot better to leave with Vi Domina and makes a lot more sense for the story, but you can do whatever you like. Wizardry 7 is quite simply one of the greatest video games ever made. 
and you are really diminishing your video gaming experience if you never try this out. Yes, it's very difficult, yes it can be clunky, but it's one of the most rewarding experiences I've ever had playing a video game in my entire life. The character creation system is second to none and is immensely satisfying to level up your characters and get just the right equipment that they need to become stunningly powerful. The pathetic weakness and ease of death at the beginning of the game just makes it all the sweeter later on when you become an ultimate badass and can kill giant transformer robots with one swing of your laser sword. It is lacking in a couple of quality of life areas here and there, and sometimes the puzzles are a little bit too challenging. But overall, the world that they've built here on Guardia is amazing. It's one that you can go back to again and again, and it's a fairly sophisticated world with quite a lot of nuance to it. There's not really necessarily a good and an evil here. There's just sort of the shades of gray that everyone in reality inhabits. And there are quite a few things, like what I mentioned about Fallout New Vegas before, that prefigure in this game from 30 years ago a lot of the stuff that's being praised right now as among the best RPG systems that we have. It was all there present way back in Wizardry 7, and, and probably in even more sophisticated form. This game is truly an immense challenge, but I love it. There's nothing like waiting 10 hours of gameplay, wading through death after death, killing so many enemies, finding so many new areas to get some amazing little snippet of dialogue from the Gorn King, or the weird philosophy from the monks and Monk Harama, or set out on the ocean on the Sea of Sorrows, 70 or 80 hours after it was teased at the very beginning of the game, or finding a giant nest of treasure chests in the middle of the Dragon Cave, guarded by a ferocious emerald dragon, or seeing the weird science fiction elements like the space girls, the helizoids, and their weird motorbikes with laser pistols. This game is enormous, it is one of the most fun experiences I've ever had, and it has one of the most remarkable and interesting atmospheres I've ever played. I'm really drawn to this grimdark, kind of sad, melancholic style of video game playing that was so prominent in the original Dark and Demon Souls, but it was all present here decades earlier, in a weird, barren kingdom that you get to explore, filled with terrifying monsters, amazing treasure, extraordinary stories to uncover, amazing NPCs to talk to, and just a world that you can live in and think about all the time, and you can play it almost endlessly. There's always another way to go back in, a new road to go down, a new way to try. I'll close this by reiterating that this is one of the greatest video games ever made, and you really owe it to yourself to give it a try. It is available on GOG.com and Steam for as little as $10. That's 10 bucks for a hundred hours or more of just one playthrough. I urge you to check it out and play this game. Don't listen to how hard it's supposed to be. Don't listen to all the stories about how terribly difficult it is. It's absolutely amazing and you're really going to be missing out if you leave this one by. Play Wizardry 7, you will not regret it. Wow, uh, thank you for making it all the way through this extremely long review. It's uh, just one of the great games ever made, and I had a lot to say about it, so it ended up being an incredibly long video to make. I'm going to leave a link here in the description to a review that I did of Wizardry 8, the sequel to this game, so you probably want to check that out, and also to a video I made about Neverwinter Nights, another fantastic role-playing game. Uh, please leave in the description suggestions of any role-playing games that you would like me to review, or that you think I should play, and I, I might 
might not have. I was thinking of making a review about some of the Might and Magic games, so let me know down there if you want me to do any of that. And please tell me if you've played Wizardry 7 what you think of the game, or if you haven't played it, if you plan on playing it uh, in the future, because it really is a, a truly amazing experience with this game, and I want everyone, I want more people to know about it and it, it to get more traction than it does. I, I want it to be known as one of the greatest games ever made, which it is. So uh, yeah, like this video if you liked it, and please subscribe to my channel if you want to see more reviews of video games, movies, television shows, etc. Uh, my name is Michael, thank you for watching, and have a great night.